Hey guys, what's up? Welcome to my channel. My name is Frank, and this is Star Boost Build Part 2. So, as you can see, I got the helmet done. And we're going to talk about how to print the helmet, orientation, little tricks and things I did to kind of make it easier. And going into this build, what kind of printers you're gonna want to probably have at your disposal, maybe a rough estimate of filament. And we're also gonna go ahead and look at the files for best the best possible orientation. There are a couple different files that DO3D offers for the helmet, because they give you two different options, which is kind of cool. And a lot more, so let's get started. So there's a few things I wanna talk about first. First of all, I apologize for any noise. I have a fan on in my room, my printers are going, it's hot in here but I don't wanna be sweating on camera, so I'm trying to cool everything down. Whatever reason you're watching this video, uh, maybe you just want to make the Star Boost helmet. You found the free files on do3d.com, you like how it looks, and this is as far as you wanna go. Maybe you plan on printing the entire suit. Maybe this is the 100th suit you've printed, but you've never made you know, Star Boost. Maybe this is your first cosplay suit and you're finally decided to take the jump because there's a actual like high quality file for free, which is pretty cool. Obviously, you're gonna need a 3D printer. Now, if you're just gonna do the helmet, something as small as like an Ender 3 or an Annette A8 Plus or you know, something like a Prussia probably will suffice. You might have to do a little bit more cutting and if you're having trouble fitting a helmet on a print surface like an Ender 3, I do have a video showing you how to cut things up, make them a little bit smaller. You can obviously print the faceplate just fine and any other little details. The back of this helmet actually does come off if you've already looked at the file, which is just awesome because if, if this was one solid thing, I wouldn't be able to get it on my head. And we're gonna talk about how I scaled this too. But say you do wanna make the jump and you wanna make a full suit. Obviously this is a pretty big part and this is two separate parts joined together with some buckles and straps. This might be your first cosplay armor. This right here was mine. If that's the case, I really wouldn't recommend using an Ender 3. It's a great little practice printer. It's, your, it's probably the ultimate starter printer. However, you're gonna severely limit yourself when it comes to printing something as big as an armor. Yes, you can. People have done it. It's not impossible. But what I mean by that is especially, especially a file like the Mark 39 that has tons and tons of these very nice detailed hexagons all over the print. You're gonna have to slice and cut up a lot of things and trying to fuse them back together and get good seam lines and weld everything and paint everything, it's just gonna be biting off a lot more than maybe that ender can handle. Now again, you can do it. It's just gonna add a lot more time, a lot more work, a lot more print. If you're gonna actually plan on doing something like the full armor, I at least suggest something around the size of an artillery Sidewinder X1, Creality CR-10S, something with like a 300 by 300 build volume. You can even get a kit for your Ender called the Ender Extender, which actually increases your Ender's print volume. You can look into something like that. But if you're actually planning on printing the full armor, get something bigger. The Star Boost files are big enough, and even with a 10S, you're gonna have to cut some things up. I actually ended up cutting up some things, more things than I thought I would, and I have a CR-10 Max. It's not that they don't fit, but if you've seen some of my other videos, hopefully you understand that just because you can print bigger doesn't mean you always should. Filament wise for my build, I'm using Monoprice PLA Plus. And Monoprice was kind enough to donate me 15 rolls of PLA Plus. So I really, I kind of have to plug them here. They didn't ask me to, but this stuff has been printing like gold. I love it. This is printing just as good as my Sunloo PLA Plus. It's half the price right now. Um, there's a link down in the description, so please check it out. If it's available in your area, try some. Try a roll. It's absolutely wonderful. It's strong. It sands well, and like, this is just the raw print, and it looks absolutely beautiful. With my rough estimates for my last suit build, I'm actually thinking I'll be able to do this in about 15 rolls or less. I have more of the suit printed right now, but I only want to talk about getting set up, the initial start to this build, and the helmet. I want to wait till I get everything else printed to talk about the upper torso. Because again, you might only be printing the helmet and this might be the end of the, video, the whole build series. For me. And then you might fast forward and when I actually paint everything. So let's take a look at the files, the orientation, how the parts are split up, and maybe how I would suggest printing them on something like an Ender and then we can switch over and how we would print them maybe on something like a CR-10. So right here I actually went and organized two different file sets. There's the solid helmet that DO3D offers, which is great, and then there's the re cut removable faceplate that DO3D offers. I also went ahead and made a little file, um, a little image folder. This way I could actually kind of see what I'm looking at, the references, 
And you can see here, this is the fused solid face plate with a removable back. And all DO3D went and did was actually make a cut line about here. And they went with the rest of the whole natural seam line. So if you get this to fit flush and print printed nice, the only extra line will be right about here. And if you get a nice enough gold for it, it really won't be that noticeable. And it'll get, allow you to motorize the faceplate. The Starboost Gemini is a spacesuit. It was never meant to have a motorized faceplate. It's a spacesuit helmet. So let's take a look at the solid helmet first and we'll drop this in slicer. But before we drop anything in the slicer, what I wanna do is go into the preference, my file preferences, and I wanna remove the auto align. This way, as we drop parts in, they line up with each other perfectly. So let's drop the main in. That looks great. And then let's go and drop the back end. So that lined up nice. And just for funsies, let's drop in the lenses. All right, so that's the whole solid helmet. Everything dropped in. And this thing just looks great. I, I love how this looks and I could not wait to paint it. So you can see the fitment, you can see the alignment. How did I scale this? So this helmet already fits me perfectly with just enough room for servos. So I did a little bit of a trick here. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna delete these lenses to allow things to move just a little bit quicker. And I'm gonna delete the back. This way there's only one polygon and I can move everything around. This is DO3D's Mark 85 helmet. And I know for a fact that this thing fits me like an absolute glove. I printed this at 100% and got very lucky. So I actually have a nice little analog for almost my exact head shape. So what I'm gonna, what I can do is take this 3D model and almost use it like a scaled model of my head to scale things. So what I actually did is I took the, the Mark 85 helmet, dropped it in next to the Mark 39 helmet, and I was actually able to use this to kind of scale and see proportions and size and just how much room is it gonna take to fit me. Now, while side by side was cool, what I ended up doing was actually dragging the helmet into each other and kind of seeing how the polygons collided with the jaw length and the back of the dome, just really just doing my best to kind of match them up and see how similar is the scale. And you can actually see it, made, it makes a pretty cool looking helmet when you fuse the two together. But these helmets are damn near the exact same size. Now, if I was to account for the back of the dome, the Mark 85 helmet is pretty much the size of my head. And then you can see the Star Boost helmet here. So from there, I could size it up a little bit and imagine I want just a little bit more room. This is gonna be a little bit of a bigger helmet, a bigger suit, so I can scale it up. However, I wanna point something out to you guys that you might not have noticed right off the bat. This is the solid fused helmet, once again, dropped in the slicer. But now let's drop the main helmet of the removable faceplate in the slicer. Look at that. These are the same file from DO3D. One's automatically bigger by a good amount. So <laughs> I'm glad I noticed this and hopefully if you guys downloaded both of these files, you noticed it. But if I was to use the left so or the right solid helmet to scale and then by going off of that scale, print the left one, my proportions are gonna be very different. Now I ended up printing the left-hand side one and I actually had to scale it down to 95% and it was still bigger than my uh, Mark 85 helmet. Now, if I had scaled the right one down, the solid faceplate to 95%, I don't think my head would have fit in it at all. Now, this isn't really deal with 3D's fault. Cool, it would have been good for them to, you know, make them the same size, but in the at the end of the day, it's kind of up to you to scale anyway. It's your print and this is something you should check anyway. So just be cognizant of it. The one with the removable faceplate is scaled much bigger. So while we have this one here, let's take a look at the removable faceplate one. And again, all they did was cut this little seam line out and everything else operates exactly the same. The back plate's the same. Now, again, since they're scaled differently, if you print the back plate from the solid helmet and then try to fit it into the full size face, removable faceplate helmet, they're not gonna match up. I don't know what the scale, I could do some math and probably figure out what the, uh, the scaling proportion is. If like this is 100%, I, whatever. I don't really care about that. Anyway, one's bigger, one's not. But this being a solid piece, it's gonna be a little bit trickier to print in one shot on a bed without using an absolute butt ton of supports. So let's go ahead and I'm gonna talk mostly about this one. So we're gonna leave this in here and then we're gonna go over to Cura and drop the main into Cura. Well, that's not gonna fit on an Ender 3. So right off the bat, we're gonna have to cut that up. And guys, I, I really can't advise you how you're gonna wanna cut this. I'm only gonna show you how I would probably cut this to fit on an Ender and really right off the bat, I would cut it right here through the jaw 
And that's actually what I ended up doing for different reasons, which I'll show you later. I would actually go right through the jaw right here using the plain cut feature in Slicer or Mesh Mixer. Cut this off because it doesn't go through any details. And then with this whole top dome part off, I would probably cut it right down the center, right up the scalp and across the center in Widow's Peak. And that would give you two side parts. From there, all I would really be trying to do is cut it in a way that avoids the honeycombs. It avoids these honeycombs and it avoids this little notch right in here so you don't have a hell of a time fusing and bonding everything back together. So say you want to, you say you had a bigger printer like a CR-10S, how could we actually fit this in there? So this will fit one shot on a CR-10S, but because of the way the jaw is shaped, you might have a little bit of a difficult time actually printing this in one part. Now, I'm not gonna sit here and go over every type of setting and what Cura does. I have helmet arrangement videos and you can go and watch that, best orientations and tips and tricks for that. By this point, if you're printing something like this, you should have a better understanding of how Cura works, what overhangs are, what, what all this red means. You should kind of have that a little couple prints under your belt. This shouldn't be Benchy Iron Man helmet. Learn the hobby a little bit, get better at it. This way, as you're navigating Cura and I'm talking about things, you'll be like, oh, that's what he means. Because this video will be a lot longer if I kind of have to sit here and explain every little bit and setting. So in a nutshell, the red is your overhang. Now, you could print it like this, that's totally fine. I am a stickler when it comes to support management. I don't like wasting supports. I will use it. I will cut parts up to use as little supports as possible. So if we're going off of my stock settings, 10%, gyroid, um, standard quality, uh, and I'm running a six millimeter nozzle, three days, nine hours, with 35% of the print being support material. But that is just ridiculous. Can you, can you guys see just how much support is being used for this? That is absolutely insane. Now, some of you right now might already be saying, oh, you don't need to support the middle of the dome. That's great if you're lucky. I have seen people get away with it, not supporting this upper dome, and it prints fine. I've seen prints fail at the very end, at the top of this dome, because they didn't support it. I've seen people cut this whole do little dome part off and make a slice right through here and glue it back on. Whichever way you want to approach this, that's fine, but the fact of the matter is, orienting this whole helmet you're probably going to end up using a lot of supports or you're going to have to cut and modify things if you're you know if your temperature isn't dialed in perfectly and your bridging settings aren't you know fantastic i don't like long prints like this this is ridiculous for just a helmet using almost an entire roll so how could we orient this a little bit better to get a little bit of better time out of it well one thing i'll always my go-to trick is just flip it flip it upside down and you lose the need for that giant amount of support However, because of this jaw is fused to the print itself, you're still gonna need to support everything up here. That's why I actually went in to Mesh Mixer and made a nice plain cut and got rid of the jaw completely. And Mesh Mixer is a little confusing to use. Play around with it, there's tons of tutorials on it, but all I'm gonna do is I'm gonna select the model, double click it, and then you can edit it and you can make a plain cut. Now this plain cut's a lot more intuitive than the one in Slicer because you can actually select and just click where you want it to go. I want it to go right there but then you can orient this right about there and you can drag and move this around and then you can rotate it like so. So like I said, I, I was doing my best to, absolute, to just avoid any details and I'm pretty happy with that. What's cool about Mesh Mixer is you can actually see exactly where it's gonna cut the actual file and model it's gonna leave you with. But if you look up here, I'm actually hitting the widow's peak so what I'm gonna to wanna to do is move this just a little bit down and get rid of that. So we'll get it a little bit closer and then maybe rotate it a little bit forward. So something like that. And what I would do is I would actually do a minimal fill. So what this is gonna do is instead of adding another layer to the cut, it's gonna backfill it and almost like, almost like an actual infill, only make a new flat surface inside the model. And then we're gonna to wanna to keep both sides. So that's a real quick crash course on how to use the plane cut feature. There's a lot more to it, but this will just get you started. So now, even though you made the cut, technically there's still one actual polygon shell. So before you export anything, what you wanna do is go to edit and then separate shells. And what it's gonna do, it's gonna give you the cut line. You can kinda of get rid of that, that doesn't matter. And then it's gonna give you the main and then the jaw. So if you, no matter which one you're selecting, so we can select the main and then export. Main cut. You can't type. 
And then we go down on the jaw and do the same thing. And that's it. So now we can go close this out and we can open them up and cure them. So let's look at the mane first. But hang on, wait. What if I don't have a helmet that I know actually fits me? What do I do then if this is the first helmet I'm printing or I can't get the sizes right? Well, my answer is gonna be print one out as a test. Print it out at 100%. See how it fits. Put it on. See what you need to make bigger. Do you need to scale it up? Do you need to scale it down? Now, that's not the ideal way for some people. I print multiple helmets and I'll go and end up selling the rest. That's fine. If you're a little more timid about wasting that much material or you don't you know, have a market or you just don't want to do that, you can print test rings. You can get a program like Armorsmith, uh, even though it's a little bit difficult to kind of size your head in Armorsmith. There's a couple different things you can use. You can look at my... Um, how to scale 3D armor video to get a couple of ideas on just different ways to scale something, but really pump out a helmet, see what it looks like. I doubt you'll have trouble giving it away to somebody if you really want to get rid of it. So now this is loaded in and we're ready to go. So let's do the same thing we did before and rotate this back. So right about here is actually exactly how I printed mine. And you can see automatically that there's no crazy overhang angles at the top. And I'm gonna rotate this down and get rid of all the red that's in here. So right about there. And if we look inside the model now, there's no real requirement for overhang. Just a little bit on the sides for the honeycomb. And let's slice this now. And our old file was what, three days, nine hours? One day, 11 hours, 41 minutes. That took so long, I had a wardrobe change. Uh, Actually, it's because my GoPro died and I was really tired, so I decided to film the rest of it the next day. But anyway, this isn't even with playing with, really messing with my support overhangs and all my angles. And uh, this is just kind of just dropping it in, orienting it, and print, you know, hitting slice. So this is the difference, uh, that what, you know, taking the time to orient and maybe cut a few parts off, can, it can really make a difference when you're uh, trying to print something. This is exactly how I printed this helmet. Again, cut the jaw off, stood it straight up, and printed it. And it saved me so much time, and especially material, it was worth just having to glue this little you know, jaw piece back on. And really from there, the rest of it is just pretty simple orientation that I've already talked about in my, uh, uh, my normal helmet orienting video. The jaw is very easy to kind of just align and slice. This is the cutout jaw, and I think on my ender, I kind of just laid it flat just like this and sliced it. Four hours and 57 grams with barely any support material required. There's gonna be nearly no waste. 4% of the time is spent on supports and that's mostly my raft. The back plate really wasn't anything too confusing either. I actually think I printed it exactly how it dropped into the program. Um, I, I, I don't, I, you could tilt it forward, you could tilt it back. What I did though is because I just wasn't too comfortable with it printing with this little uh, you know, low collision, I believe I added in some support, extra uh, custom supports into these spots right here, just to give this the best possible chance of surviving. Nine, out, nine and a half hours, 113 grams. With really an absolute minuscule amount of supports, and again, this is just for survi survivability, and it actually doesn't collide at all with the hexagons, which is great. That's gonna make them print out a lot better. Um, and just I won't have to worry about anything crazy for support removal. So I'm pretty sure that's how I, I sent the back plate. Um, I wish I had saved all the G-code for every print I've pop, popped out so far, but this works just as well and me explaining on what I look for. And I believe I printed the face plate exactly the way it's standing. This was the best orientation I could find. And as long as you have your supports set to everywhere, it'll actually generate the supports in the eye sockets. 11 and a half hours and 136 grams. So that's not bad at all. The only thing I would worry about is the same problem I have with most face masks. And you might have run into this problem before too. Right down here where it collides with the raft, this usually doesn't survive. I've had tons of face masks fail because of right here, as it builds, this is a very low interface and it builds up quite a good amount before it actually starts to collide with the support material. So what I would do in this instance is again, go and add some custom supports. And if you don't have custom supports, you go up to the marketplace and just search literally custom supports. It's right here, very simple. You just search it in the plugins and you'll be able to download and add custom supports. And then I'll just throw a couple in here and here and slice it. 
11 and, 11 and a half hours. For a faceplate, that's not bad at all. Um, I think it would take a little bit longer on an Ender, but still pretty worth it. And you can already see how much better supported that little uh, bottom part of the jaw is. And it's gonna be supported basically through the whole start of the print, and then you're you know good to go from there. Um, you could again, play with orientation all you want. Maybe try to get rid of these really tall, weird supports in the middle. Honestly, you might not even really need them. It doesn't look like they're uh, interfering and doing much of anything anyway. But yeah, to each his own, play around with it and see what works best for you. Now guys, if you followed most of that and you kind of took some of those tips, uh, you, you should end up with a pretty decent helmet and not a lot of waste material. Uh, I'm pretty happy with how my faceplate turned out. It was pretty smooth. And then I've already gone and actually welded the jaw piece to the main dome again. And you can look in my, um, my PLA welding tutorial and you should end up with something roughly like this. And as the build progresses, I'm gonna show you guys how I plan to uh, do magnets and elastic straps for the back of the, the dome piece. We're gonna go through, we're gonna motorize the helmet, my whole painting and post-processing uh, tips and tricks and just, just stay tuned for this. Um, I have a lot of Starboost already printed. I'm basically done with the entire upper half. And during the making of this video, they actually released the, um, the lower half. So I have the leg files too. So uh, we'll be talking about those, looking at them. Their, their legs are really cool. Um, they also just released a new whole chest file where it's instead of just one big chest part, it's all cut up into separate pieces, which makes it a lot easier to print. I actually already printed off the little collar part and it came out perfect. I wish I could make this video an hour or two hours long because I just have so much I can talk about with this. There's so, again, there's so much I've just learned from my previous build that uh, I just, I'm hoping I can, help you guys even more with this Star Wars build. Especially since this is a free file, I think a lot more people are gonna be doing it or at least experimenting with it to hopefully jump into their first real big Iron Man build. If you guys liked this video, I know it was a little bit long, but I really wanted to be as thorough as possible. Uh, please, if you guys could like subscribe, that'd be awesome. Uh, it helps me out a lot. And uh, this way you can follow the whole Star Moose build and stay up to date at while I'm you know, uploading these videos. Stay tuned for more Mark 85 update videos. I'm working on them. There's just, I have a lot going on and uh, I'm trying to balance it all out right now. Um, if you guys like these type of videos, let me know, drop a comment, message me on Instagram, ask me any questions that I didn't cover in this, but please be cognizant. I am gonna, there are more Star Wars videos coming. So if you have questions about the chest, slicing the arms, they are coming. I, I promise, you know, I will cover as much as I can. Orientation, slicing, printing, and uh, I think that about does it. Thank you so much for watching and have a good day.